Today lectures I am going to talk about phenomenal consciousness qualia and quining qualia. The phenomenal consciousness plays vital role in philosophy of mind. The phenomenal consciousness is one of the most important aspect of explaining the concept of mind because the phenomenal consciousness cannot be explained in terms of physicalistic or mechanistic way. Even if some philosophers and some scientists they are trying to explain it, but those explanations are not acceptable. Why it is not acceptable and I will be discussing in this lectures. As we know that conscious experience not only refers to the psychological concept of mind, but also refers to the phenomenal concept of mind. The phenomenal concept of mind as conscious experience and of a mental state as a consciously experienced mental state and the psychological concept of mind as the causal or explanatory basis of behavior. But according to the psychological concept of it matters little whether a mental state has a conscious quality or not. Here we find a fundamental distinction between both the conceptions. According to the phenomenal concept of mind, the mind is characterized by the way it feels and on the psychological concept of mind is characterized by what it does. For Chalmers, this distinction between psychological and phenomenal mind is absolutely necessary. Here he remarks, I quote, I will sometimes speak of the phenomenal and psychological aspect of mind and sometimes of the phenomenal mind and the psychological mind. At this early stage, I do not wish to beg any question about whether the phenomenal and the psychological will turn out to be the same thing. According to Chalmers, every phenomenal state is a psychological state in that it plays a significant role in the causation and explanation of behavior and every psychological state has an intimate relation to the phenomenal concept of mind. Accordingly, there is a, a conceptual distinction between the two notions. What it means for a state to be phenomenal is for it to feel a certain way and what it means for a state to be psychological is for it to play an appropriate causal role. The distinction between the phenomenal and the psychological has a long history. Here we can points out Descartes concept of mind. Descartes is partly responsible for this because Descartes held that every event in the mind is a cognitive or a, a content of experience. To this class, he assimilated volitions, intentions and every type of thought. He assumed that every psychological that is worthy of being called mental has a conscious aspect. That is, whatever is a mental uh, content is necessarily, according to Descartes, a content of conscious uh, experience. Therefore, for him, the notion of unconscious method state is a, a contradiction in terms. After Descartes, a new objective brand of psychological explanation was developed with no room for consciousness in its explanation. This mode of explanation had only partly success, but it established the idea that psychological explanations can be proceed while ignoring the phenomenal. But behaviorists differed in their theoretical positions. Some recognized the existence of consciousness, found it irrelevant to true psychological explanation and some denied its existence altogether. Many went further denying the existence of any kind of mental state. Behaviorist in general accepted that the mental states are irrelevant in the explanation of behavior. 
which could be carried out entirely in external terms. The move from behaviorism to computational cognitive science for the most preserved the idea that there are no two intentional mental states, although the move brought back a role for internal states, which could even be called mental state and there was nothing particularly phenomenal about them. Uh, these states were admissible precisely on the grounds of their role in the explanation of behavior. The concept of mental therefore, was taken to be synonymous with psychological. This explanation of phenomenal concept of leaves it unclear why there is anything phenomenal at all. According to him, there is no great mystery about how a state might play a causal role, but what is truly mysterious is why that state should feel like something, why it should have a phenomenal quality at all. In Chalmers word, we can see, I quote, there is no great mystery about how a state might play some causal role, although there are certainly technical problems there for science. What is mysterious is why that state should feel like something, why it should have a phenomenal quality, why the causal role is played and why the phenomenal qualities present are two entirely different questions. The functionalist analysis denies the distinction of these questions and therefore, to be unsatisfactory. The phenomenal concept deals with the first person aspect of mind, while psychological concept deals with the third person concept of mind. The dualism between the phenomenal and the psychological is the fact that the dualism between the first person and the third person perspective of the mind. Let us see the first person and the third person perspective of mind. The double aspect of mind or mental terms are psychological and phenomenal. The concept of pain provides a clear example. The term is often used to name a particular sort of unpleasant phenomenal quality. On the other hand, there is also a psychological notion associated with the term. The concept of the sort of state that is causally connected with the damage to the organism the relation of the organism and so on. Both of these aspects are central to the common sense notion of pain. The reason why phenomenal and psychological properties often run together is clear. It is because the relevant properties tend to co-occur when the processes resulting from tissue damage leading to discomfort take place some sort of phenomenal quality arises. That is, when psychological pain is presented, some sort of experience of pain is also present phenomenal. Chalmers says that it is not a conceptual truth that the processes should be accompanied by the phenomenal quality, but it is a fact about the world. Once we have this state of co-occurrence of properties, in everyday situations, it is natural that our everyday conception of things will bind them together. From the above discussions, we find that many mental concepts lead a sort of double life. For example, perception can be taken as a psychological process involving cognitive response to the environment. On the other hand, it may also be taken phenomenally involving the conscious experience of what it is perceived. Chalmers holds that some of these concepts lean more strongly toward the phenomenal and some lean toward the psychological. The concept of sensation, which is close to the concept of perception has both phenomenal and psychological components. The phenomenal component is more prominent in sensation than in perception sensation. 
is something like perceptions phenomenal counterpart. And then now the question sir, can there be a mental concept which is psychological, but not phenomenal. That is again is it the case that the psychological and the phenomenal are factually a co-occurrent, but are independent causally. Chalmers endorses the factual uh, co-occurrence of the psychological and phenomenal, but not their necessary relation. It is evident in his analysis the propositional attitudes like beliefs, desire, etcetera. In the case of propositional attitudes, the central feature of this mental state is their semantic content or intentionality. Phenomenal experience thus is not directly associated with a propositional attitude. However, a belief though psychological is still a state unconscious such that as Searle says the intentional content of a belief depends entirely on the associated state of consciousness that the belief can be can bring about without consciousness all that is present is as if intentional. What Searle intends to say is that the belief is always associated with consciousness because non conscious machines have no beliefs. A conscious mind alone has the capacity of intentionality about the world. Chalmers argues with Sol on the analysis of propositional attitudes. Chalmers has shown that all mental states have a psychological and a phenomenal aspect and we need not legitimate which is primary. Although a strong case might be made for a psychological analysis, there is no aspect of this state that outstrips both the psychological and the phenomenal. Thus, psychology and phenomenology together constitute the central aspect of the mind. In spite of togetherness between phenomenology and psychology, we cannot identify the phenomenal with the psychology. There are two distinct aspects of the mind. The phenomenal is picked out as the experience that tends to accompany psychological. We can coherently imagine a situation in which the phenomenal quality occurs without the psychological properties. This distinction between the phenomenal and the psychological is source of the distinction between the easy and the hard aspect of the human mind. Why it is easy and why it is hard? It is easy because it is a phenomenal consciousness. It is a conscious experience which cannot be explained in the functional terms. It is hard because it cannot be explained in the phenomenal consciousness. It is easy because it can be explainable in the scientific way. And if it is explanation in the scientific way, then it is a easy problem. But actually, the problem of consciousness is the one of the hard problem of consciousness according to David Chalmers. Let us see the phenomenal consciousness. As you have seen, mental terms are dual in nature. There are two concepts of consciousness, psychological consciousness and phenomenal consciousness. One may put forward an explanation of consciousness by emphasizing the phenomenal quality of consciousness, but will end by giving an explanation of some aspect of psychological consciousness, such as the ability to introspect, to think and to perceive etcetera. There are varieties of psychological consciousness such as awareness, introspections, self consciousness, attention, voluntary content, knowledge and many other mental states. These are holds that all largely functional notions and this can be seen from a psychological perspective, although many of them are associated with the phenomenal state. It is clear that there is a phenomenal and a psychological property 
in the vicinity of each of these concepts, the phenomenal and the psychological properties in the vicinity of these notions tend to occur together, but as with other mental concept they should not be conflated. We should also be careful not to conflate the phenomenal sense of these terms with phenomenal consciousness in general. We may point out that psychological perspective of consciousness can be analyzable in terms of phenomenal perspective, but phenomenal consciousness cannot be explained in terms of psychological perspective because of its irreducibility and non compulsional nature or non mechanical nature. For Chalmers, the reductive explanation of consciousness is not possible because consciousness cannot be logically supermanent on the physical. This non reductive aspect of consciousness is naturally supervenient, but not logically supervenient. Chalmers writes that to make the case against the reductive explanation, we need to show that consciousness is not logically supervenient on the physical. In principle, we need to show that it does not supervene globally, that is, that all the microphysical facts in the world do not entail the facts about consciousness. In practice, it is easier to run the argument locally, argument that in an individual microphysical fact in the world do not entail the facts about consciousness. When it comes to consciousness, local and global supervenience plausibly stand and fall together. So, it does not matter much which we run the argument if consciousness supervenance at all. It almost certainly supervenes locally if this is disputed. However, all the arguments can be run at the global level with the straightforward alternations. This is because the phenomenal property of consciousness makes it different from all other properties. If phenomenal consciousness would have been logically supervenient on the physical body, then it would have been functionally identical with the latter. In that case, consciousness would be explained completely in terms of physical properties. As Chalmers argues, of course, there is a sense in which the physics of the universe most entails the existence of consciousness. If one defines physics as the fundamental science from whose facts and laws everything else follows, this construal of physics, however, trivializes the questions involved. If one allows physics to include theories developed specially to deal with the phenomena of consciousness, unmotivated by more basic considerations, then we may get an explanation of consciousness, but it will certainly not be a reductive one. For our purpose, it is best to take physics to be the fundamental science developed to explain observations of the external world. If this kind of physics entails the facts about consciousness without invoking consciousness itself in a crucial role, then consciousness would truly be reductively explained. For the reason David Chalmers have given, uh, there is a good reason to believe that no such reductive explanation is uh, possible. Therefore, one cannot reduce facts about uh, consciousness to physical facts and cannot explain the occurrence of consciousness. Chalmers argues that there is little hope that a purely physicalist or materialistic theory can explain consciousness at all, especially 
the phenomenal or qualitative aspect of consciousness. We may say that our knowledge of consciousness comes from our experience and not from external observations. The existence of the external world is not enough for us to assume the existence of conscious experience. It is only the first person experience of consciousness which possesses the problem of non-computationality in consciousness. Therefore, it is subjective character of experience which is not analyzable through any explanatory systems of functional state or human behavior. If it is logically supervenient, there would be a, no such epistemic asymmetry. A logical supervenient cannot be detected straightforwardly and there is no special role for the first persons. Therefore, it is subjective character of experience which is not analyzable through any explanatory system of functional states or human behavior. If it is logically supervenient on this, then there would be no such epistemic asymmetry a logical supervenient can be deleted straightforwardly and there is no special role for the past person case. Chalmers shows that consciousness is a first person phenomena and cannot be inferred or, or defined from the physicalistic or mechanistic way. This is because there is a gap between physical level and the level of conscious experience. Consciousness cannot be explained reductively because it can be explained in its own terms because the conscious mental states as distinguished from the physical facts have a subjective aspect. For example, the mental state of pain which is not the same as the state of the brain. Since there is subjective experience of pain is not explainable in terms of the computational functions of the brain. Thus, conscious experience can be reductively explained in terms of physical and functional laws of the brain. Now, we have to see the concept of qualia and how qualia is explaining in the phenomenal consciousness because the conscious experience is nothing but the phenomenal qualia. The term qualia means the qualitative character of experience. Every experience has a distinct qualitative character. The subjective or qualitative feel of a conscious experience is characterized as something which is organisms necessarily have in order to be conscious. Thus, qualia are the qualitative subjective experience of mental state and the properties of conscious experience. Now, the question is are these subjective experiences or qualia real? It is a controversial question among philosophers whether qualia are definable in functional terms and whether qualia are the psychological state of the brain. The most important argument is that qualia are the functional states of the brain and thus are real only as the physical state of the brain. Opposed to this is the argument that qualia are the qualitative feel of the conscious states and so are subjective in character. Subjective experience thus have qualia inherent in them. In other words, an experience is a conscious experience if and only if there is some raw feel in which is subjective. Qualia are experiential properties of sensations, feelings, perceptions or the way it feels to have a pain or the way it feels to see. According to Ned Block, the qualia or qualia that include the ways it feels to see, hear and smell the way it feels to have a pain, more generally what it is like to have mental states. Qualia are experimental properties of sensations, feelings, perceptions and thought and desire as well also. The first person experience such as pain, color, sensation 
and the sensation of touch and smell etcetera are the qualitative experience of mental states. These mental states are the common stuff of mind. For example, in having the smell of flower or the taste of ice cream, we have subjective experience of these things, but we cannot describe them because these experiences have a distinctive phenomenal character. Our color experience are such that there is something like to have them with a phenomenological image. A qual is thus a mental state that has the property of being a phenomenal experience. Qualia constitutes the essence of conscious states. For example, the qualia pain is the feeling of a pain rather than a mere bodily sensation. Thus, the qualia are the raw feeling association with the conscious state. The type of conscious experience is something we cannot do without if we are to generate and test hypothesis about the links between the phenomenological and the psychological, the psychological and the neural. The qualitative experiences like experiences of color, smell, taste, pain, etcetera can be explained in neuroscientific terms. These experiences play a causal role in the domain of mental state. The experience of pain for example, has the belief that he is in pain and he acquires a desire to take step to recapturate. When he is in pain, he is in a state that definitely has a range of causal or dispositional properties. However, in addition to the to their functional role, the qualitative experience have a characteristics phenomenal field called qualia. Saul uh, argues that every conscious state has certain qualitative field to it. For example, the conscious experience of tasting beer is very different from hearing some music and from smelling a rose or watching a movie. Both of these have a different qualitative character. Hence, there are the different qualitative features of conscious experiences. Thus, qualia constitute the essential properties of conscious experiences. That is why one cannot derive pleasure of drinking beer by listening to music or the pleasure of witnessing sunset by smelling a rose. That is a logical not a, an empirical truth and Chalmers characterized it as the subjective quality of experience. A mental state is conscious if there is something it is like to be in that mental state. To put it another way, we can say that a mental state is conscious if it has a qualitative feel or a qualitative experiences. These qualitative fields are also known as phenomenal qualities or qualia for short. The problem of explaining these phenomenal qualities is just the problem of explaining consciousness. According to Chalmers, phenomenally conscious states are not functional state, but can be realized through our experience like the experience of red. The phenomenal consciousness does not supervene metaphysically on lower level facts. That is to say, even though two functional states are isomorphic they differ in phenomenal consciousness. An experience or other mental entity is phenomenal conscious only when there is something to be like to be that state. For example, perceptual experiences like testing, seeing, feeling, etc. are cases of such experiences. The qualities available to us in conscious experience are the qualities which represent objects in the world. Thus, qualia are conceived as the qualitative characteristics of mental state which include perceptions, sensations, affections, desires, thought and beliefs. For every conscious experiences or conscious mental state, there is something which is like for the subject to have it or to be in it. They have a phenomenal fear or raw feeling. Hence, problem of 
phenomenal consciousness is the problem of explaining how subjective feel is instantiated in the brain. Phenomenal consciousness is a form of state consciousness. It is a property which some but not other mental states possesses. Specifically, it is a property which mental states have when it is like something to undergo them and phenomenally conscious states have distinct subjective fields and some would say they have qualia. Phenomenal conscious properties are experiential properties. For example, we have phenomenal conscious states what we see, hear, smell, taste and have pains. These properties are the experimental properties of sensations, feelings and perceptions and thoughts etc. Thus, the phenomenal feature of the mind is characterized by what it is like for a subject to have that feature. Phenomenal experience is not merely a succession of qualitative distinguished sensory ideas, but rather the organized cognitive experience of a world of objects and of ourselves as subject within that world. However, according to the functionalist, minds are complex arrangement of functional states, states that bear the right kinds of causal relation to one another and to inputs and outputs. A functionalist may therefore asserts that experiences themselves lack qualities of their own, qualities indefinable independently of the qualities of object experienced or although an experience may have qualities, these are not qualities we are in any sense aware of in understanding the experience. This subjective quality of experience or qualitative experiences is very difficult to get from the psychological aspect of mind and this distinction is very applicable to philosophy of mind it is because there is a phenomenal and psychological distinctions. The phenomenal consciousness is a kind of conscious experience or qualitative experience and that is called as qualia and because of this qualia it is very difficult to explain consciousness in mechanistic or functionalistic way and some of this qualia uh, I will be explaining in the next uh, lectures. Thank you.